Welcome back to season two of What If, a monthly podcast series delivering a crash course on all areas of intergenerational injustice. Now, over season one, with the help of some policy experts and young change makers on the ground, we delved into a range of topics from the rising student debt crisis to touching accounts of mental health. And now we're back. Over the next five months, I'll be taking you on a continued whistle stop tour, touching on everything that we haven't so far but you'll have to stay tuned to see what we've got in store. We're very grateful to Curtis Banks, a self-invested pension specialist, for sponsoring the research undertaken in this episode. And later, I'll be speaking to them about why intergenerational fairness is so important to their organisation. What if? What if? What if? What if? A monthly podcast series in partnership with IF, the Intergenerational Foundation. We're kicking off this season with a special episode. It's special in that it's IF's 10 year anniversary. So much has happened in the last 10 years. Let's have a look. We kicked off the decade with a new coalition government between the Conservative David Cameron and Liberal Democrat Nick Clegg. This is a new government and it's a new kind of government. A radical reforming government where it needs to be, and a source of reassurance and stability. The duo took the decision to cut public spending in order to get Britain's finances in order, an economic crisis which they blamed Labour for. The reality wasn't quite the united front. So do you now regret when once asked what your favourite joke was, you replied, Nick Clegg? Uh, we're all going to have. I'm afraid I did oh, once. Right. I'm, I'm, uh... <laughs> Then came the introduction of the triple lock pension, years of austerity and the decision to triple university fees. Thousands of students have clashed with police at Westminster today during a mass demonstration against plans to increase university tuition fees in England. Famously, infamously, couldn't uh, put into practice uh, my party's policy on tuition fees for reasons which I hope you're familiar with. They were introduced by Labour and actually jacked up by Labour and uh, there was no money left. Uh, but, you know, it was a broken promise. You betrayed the young oh, people of our country. Can I reply? Can I reply? Very I mean, you know, I, I get this sort of pious uh, stance from Ed Miliband. Putting the plug on public funding and dumping the cost onto students. Isn't that why he's betraying his promise on tuition fees? And then we had a political decision that truly severed the generational divide. The British people have voted to leave the European Union and their will must be respected. Their will or just the will of the elder generation? Many years of failed Brexit talks, a sorrowful resignation. I do so with no ill will, but with enormous and enduring gratitude to have had the opportunity to serve the country I love. And record rates of youth unemployment. Surely things couldn't get more turbulent for Britain's young. Good evening. The coronavirus is the biggest threat this country has faced for decades, and this country is not alone. (laughs) Oh wait, they could. The last 10 years of IF's existence have been eventful, to say the least. And it wouldn't be an anniversary episode without talking to the people who started the journey. So I'm joined by three of IF's co-founders, Liz Emerson, Angus Hanton and Ashley Seagar, to talk about the last 10 years. So 10 years ago, you decided to found the Intergenerational Foundation. Why? 10 years ago, a group of economists, including Angus and Ashley, academics, business people, some politicians, were increasingly concerned about the prospects of their children and grandchildren. And the term intergenerational fairness wasn't really in the public domain. And so the Intergenerational Foundation was established. It was set up as a research and education think tank with a mission to ensure that all future policy is assessed through its impact on younger and future generations. I think it's also true that we were were annoyed at the way that the government was treating younger people. And we just felt they were, it was a form of discrimination really, They were favouring older people at the expense of young people. And the way Ashley put it was very good at that time and very true. He said that every time you turned over a rock, you found another monster. And as we looked at the issues, we found that there were more and more areas where young people's interests had been 
ignored or overridden. And what was really interesting was that no other think tank or organisation was, was researching explicitly the concept of intergenerational fairness. So, so we think that we deserve a, a pat on the back, actually. And at least what you won't know is that back in 2011, when we, when we first launched, our um, very first research report um, found that there were 25 million underoccupied bedrooms. Um, that was a new stat in the housing world. And before we knew where we were, we were across all of the mainstream media and the national newspapers um, to such an extent that we had a David Dimbleby um, actually trying to pronounce the words intergenerational as part of, que as part of question time. Um, and, and, his, and his question was, and, and what is this new think tank called the Intergenerational Foundation? When we did our first launch, and Ashley and I were at BBC Studios in White City, um, one of the things that the interviewer said to me in between interviews is he said, it's amazing, you guys have turned the phone lines blue. And what he meant was older people were phoning in with full of expletives and swearing at us because we dared to raise the question of fairness between generations and suggest even su to suggest that the older generation might have taken more than their share. But, you know, since 2011, we've actually published over 70 research reports. I was just counting them in the office today. Each year, we've had around 60 national media um, uh, editorials or TV or radio. And um, we've, really, we've really pushed everybody from politicians to the academia, to the think tankers, to really think about what the impact of their decisions are on younger and future generations. And we've had quite a few successes actually. Um, one of the biggest successes we had was on buy-to-let taxation. Yes, we pointed out, we called it the big tax let-off buy-to-let because the income from it for landlords was, was terribly undertaxed. And, and uh, as a result of that, of our report, the Treasury did actually change it, um, did change, the increase the taxation on buy-to-let income. We've set up conversations around the kitchen table whereby older generations are increasingly sympathetic to the plight of their children and grandchildren. I think from my perspective, it's more the fact that you've put the topic of intergenerational unfairness or injustice onto the agenda, because without a term, without a phrase, it's very difficult to raise awareness for something if you're not aware that it's even there. So now we've reached your 10 year anniversary. And what have you done to commemorate this? When we set up the organisation, we hoped that we wouldn't be needed 10 years later. We hoped that the problems would be solved and there'd be fairness between generations. In fact, the study that we've done for our 10th anniversary report shows that in the policy areas we've looked at, younger generations have, been, have lost out in nine out of the 10 areas. So actually, it turns out we're more needed now than ever before. And of course, in, in the last 18 months, everything's just got much worse because of the pay now, worry later attitude of politicians towards COVID-19, which has seen a massive run up in the national debt and a massive hit to economic output, predominantly to young people. So in a way, we're back in a worse position than we were 10 years ago. But has that made us more passionate about the need to ensure there is change tomorrow? I think, I think we are just as determined to keep going 10 years on. It will be really interesting to see what the next 10 years have in store. To mark their 10-year anniversary, IF has released an incredible piece of research in the form of a report. It's called A Decade of Intergenerational Unfairness. I'm joined by IF researcher Lizzie Simpson to talk more about the report's key findings. What I love about these chapters is that they correspond really, really well with our podcast episodes of season one. So your chapter on higher education works really well with our episode on tuition fees. Housing, again, corresponds with our episode on the housing crisis. But maybe for some of our new listeners who haven't been listening to season one, could you talk through the structure of your report and maybe some of the key findings? Yeah, sure. Um... So the aim of the report was to investigate how the situation for young people in the UK has changed over the last decade. 
Um, so in this report, we looked at 10 different policy areas and a total of 31 different indicators. And what we found is that for 26 of these indicators, the situation had actually worsened or stagnated for young people. So unfortunately, I don't think there's enough time in this interview to go over all 31, but I'll try and cover some of the key areas now. Um, so we found that younger age groups are significantly more likely to be unemployed or to be in involuntary part-time employment. So we also looked at the issue of housing, which you mentioned, um, and we found that home ownership is becoming increasingly unattainable for younger people. Um, we also looked at education and we found that in 2019, for the first time in UK history, more than 50% of young people were attending university. However, the number of graduate jobs hasn't kept up with the number of graduates. So in 2019, around 45% of recent graduates and 35% of non-recent graduates were working in non-graduate roles. Um, Those stats are actually quite depressing because your report basically found out that out of the 10 policy areas that you investigated, over the last decade, young people have sort of fallen behind on nine out of those 10, with environment being the only area where there has been a little bit of progress that's been made. Yeah, no, it is quite depressing. And I think, um, yeah, the environment was the only area that showed signs of progress, because obviously, um, in recent years, there has been a lot more policy attention given to the environment and climate change, and we are starting to do things about it, and it is moving in the right direction. Whether it's moving fast enough is, is a different story. But I think, yeah, it is very depressing because obviously throughout history, we always want the next generation to be doing better than the one that came before us. So we always want to increase prosperity, increase standard of living. And what this report really shows is that, you know, for the first time in, history, in, in a long time, progress is going in the opposite direction. And young people are actually in many areas having a worse standard of life than their parents and grandparents did. I think one area that I found quite interesting within your report was public services and we haven't really touched upon it within our podcast episodes at all but I find it interesting because essentially it's how much the government wants to spend on us and the distribution of that resources or those resources across the population I think you can tell quite a lot about the mindset of the party in power by looking at this distribution so what are your key findings here? Yeah no definitely I agree um, so the main finding here is that the government's been consistently spending more on each pensioner than it has on each child and that this gap has been increasing over the past decade. Um, so we looked at a, a, a few different uh, types of public services so for education as expected this is higher for children as they're the age group who are in school but we've still seen that over the last 10 years education spending on children has stagnated and started to decline we also found that spending on free travel for pensioners per person has increased by almost 12 times between 1999 and 2018. And concessionary travel for pensioners is protected by law, whereas concessionary travel for children and young people is not. We can start to see the effect of these policies when we look at poverty rates for different age groups. Um, so we see that the increased spending on pensioners has had a positive impact as poverty rates for this age group fell from 18% to 11% between 2001 and 2019. But at the other end of the scale, we see that reduced spending on children has led to child poverty rates increasing over the last 10 years. I think the travel thing really annoys me because over 60s always get concessions or free travel. But the age for retirement is like, what, 66, 67? Mm. Um, it's very strange that young people who don't have an income don't get free travel, yet those who are older but not of retirement age yet, so they should still be working, do. It's like a really odd system. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I think um, what makes it particularly unfair that is that in 2013, young people are no longer allowed to leave school at 16, so they have to still be in education or training. Um, so quite a lot of them are required by law to continue going to educational training and having to pay public transport to get there a lot of the time. But this is not protected by concessionary law, whereas for older people who might not be having to go there, theirs is. And yeah, it, it's completely unfair. Do you think that COVID has sort of overshadowed the last 10 years? Well, I guess not really the last 10 years, is it? Has what, Do you think COVID has sort of cast this shadow over government policy and spending because this report makes it really clear that we need to look beyond covid what why is that um yeah i mean i don't know about overshadowed but i think definitely covid19 has massively accelerated lots of the trends that we've been talking about in this report 
Um, so, for example, we've seen a huge increase in youth unemployment um, in the year following February 2020, over three in five job losses were in under 25s. Um, and we also see, so even before the pandemic, house prices were very unaffordable for young people. And the impact of the last year has seen house prices rise by 13% in the UK since the start of the pandemic. Um, and we also see like the huge impact this has had on the mental health of young people. Um, so younger age groups have been much more likely to report higher levels of anxiety and loneliness during the pandemic and lower levels of happiness and life satisfaction. So I think definitely COVID-19 has had a huge negative impact for young people. But I think there is a real risk that when we look back on this period of history, we might end up blaming the struggles of young people solely on COVID-19. And we do see this happening a bit already, like in the media, they're referring to young people as generation COVID. But this report shows that COVID has actually only amplified existing generational inequalities that have been present for years before the pandemic began. Yeah, I really hope that they don't start using COVID as a scapegoat because it isn't that, you know, like, like you said, these problems were already on a downward trend over the last 10 years. And this report shows that I hope that COVID isn't used as the sole reason to blame. Yeah, there just is a danger that people might be looking at statistics for young people and being like, oh, it was COVID's fault. And really, it's just a lot more complicated than that. It's a lot of factors that have been present for a long time. And I think, yeah, we just need to make sure that we're not using COVID as a get out of jail free card. We need to hold people and their decisions to their account. I think often we can forget to look at the bigger picture. And this is something that this report does excellently. Now, one of the big things underpinning so many of these issues over the last 10 years is the economy. I'm joined by Oxford University Professor of Geography, Danny Dawling, to understand a little more about the economic trajectory over the last 10 years and what this has meant for young people. So let's close in on young people specifically, because if the rate of economic growth is gradually slowing down, surely that's disadvantageous to all generations. So economically, what are some of the major obstacles that young people have faced specifically over the last decade? Well, the rate of economic growth slowing down isn't necessarily a problem if you share out what you have. But at the same time as it slowed down, at least from the 1980s, the amount at which we shared it out decreased. In the last decade in the, in the UK, several things have happened which have been particularly bad for young people. For better off young people, that the half of young people who go to university, uh, we introduced around about 2012 the highest university fees in Europe. Most of Europe has hardly any fees. Uh, but we introduced £9,000 a year. Um, other European countries don't do that because older people pay for the education of younger people. Um, but for those half of young people who don't go to university, just to make things fair, we introduced a regime of sanctions so that if they came to claim benefits and they made one mistake, uh, for instance, not turning up at a particular interview when they're supposed to, then they would be fined and have their benefits sanctioned. And in the year 2014, the sanctions were so high that more people were sanctioned more money than all the fines given out by all the magistrates' courts of England and Wales and all the sheriffs' courts in Scotland combined. The, the economic crash of 2008 uh, impacted young people more than any other uh, group. You know, young people, especially myself, were always told, you know, just wait, it'll get better. And all the money you're spending on your degrees at the moment, it's worth it because, you know, you'll get a yeah. job eventually. And it's this idea of trying to justify economic hardship in the present with the promise of yielding more fruitful results later on. But you yeah. don't think that this really corresponds to reality. This is really clever. This idea of just wait is really clever. Now, because you know that old people are going to die, and then this is the kind of the thing that makes you think it's inevitable, you know, stop worrying about the fact that their houses are really expensive. They're going to die, so you're going to get those houses one day. And the same for the job. Stop worrying about the fact that your job may not pay you very well and you've got this enormous debt for having gone to university. Those old people will retire and they'll die, so one day it comes to you. You know, tomorrow belongs to you. And it sounds really, really plausible. But the problem, <laughs> the problem is a small group of people will end up with more. A small group will end up owning the houses. Um, in fact, we can already see that small group because they've been growing and growing. That it's called buy to let landlord. So a small number of young people will be really well off old people in future. 
but not most of the young generation. You say that policy focused on future growth can't be trusted. Yes. Why? Uh, well, that's, that, that is, well, it's never worked in the past, even when we had higher rates of growth. But increasingly, what, what growth we have, which is less and less, is now taken by a smaller and smaller proportion. So then what do you propose as a solution? What, what should be driving policy if it's not future yeah. growth? You simply get rid of university fees. It's possible to do it, and then you have to work out the way to recompense the people who shouldn't have had to pay them. Um, if you say, well, where does the money come from? We can't afford it. Well, we did suddenly find 400 billion for COVID. You know, it's, 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 it was always there. Germany manages to do it somehow. Um, France manages to do it, not just Scandinavia, the Netherlands, I can go all the way around Europe, you know. In fact, more countries manage to do it than the ones that don't. I was reading the manifesto of um, Dominic Cummings yesterday, which he wrote in 2013. And there's a line in it when he wrote, you can identify at the age of 13, he said, uh, whether somebody, a child, is in the top one in 10,000 of ability, and then nurture them. So Dominic Cummings, who became the chief advisor to Boris Johnson, has a belief that only a few people are very smart, including him, of course. And if you, if you believe this of human beings, if you think that just a few are super able like you, then you've got a tricky position because you can't say to people, look, you all thick, just let me be in charge, because they don't like that. So you have to promise them something else. And that's what's been happening. So you're essentially saying that instead of jamming tomorrow, we should be sharing today. We should be sharing today, and, and this is not a radical kind of revolutionary sharing. This is a sharing like the German share kind of thing. Um, you know, so if you, if you look at how things are distributed in that country, they spend a billion more a week on their health services. This idea of sharing out better and sharing out now alters other things, other ways in which you behave. Uh, and other prospects for the future uh, and we just don't have it we have we have this dog eat dog competition get into lots of debt get your degree fight for a job and if you don't manage to pay your way out of it well that's your own fault for not having tried hard enough and if you can't get a house and a mortgage well you obviously just married or got together with the wrong person didn't you and, and it's a different yeah very very different way of behaving no, that's very, very true. And, and you mentioned how we got, you know, £400 billion pounds to spend on COVID. And does it seem fair to young people that the government is considering raising income tax and or national insurance as a means of covering this? And <laughs> what would you propose as the better solution then? I would look again at wealth taxation. Um, and it's looked at across Europe and it's tricky to do. Um, but it's what we've done before when there have been crises, normally in wartime. So for, for a one-off emergency like COVID, uh, that's the way to, to deal with it. You, don't, you, you increase taxation on better off people, partly to stop them hoarding all the resources that otherwise need to be shared. So Danny has suggested one solution, but what do our co-founders think? If I had to give you one policy, it would be that all policy has to be assessed for its impact on younger and future generations. And if it's found to be negative on young generations, it should be thrown out as a policy. I would probably add to that uh, taxation of wealth, because that's the really big uh, inequality is the, the old sit on so much of it untaxed and the young sit on so little of it. And if they do work to try and make up for it, they get hit by these heavy marginal tax rates that Liz mentioned earlier. So I think the ta taxation system is, is flawed, fundamentally flawed. And without a fix, we'll never make any progress on intergenerational fairness. I think the change in approach needs to be that politicians take off their rose tinted spectacles. And whilst they still have available their glasses, which show them about class difference, they put on a new pair of glasses which show them where they look at through the lens of intergenerational fairness and see society from that perspective. IF's anniversary report is important and it's vital that policymakers have a thorough understanding of the issues that were affecting young people before the pandemic. As mentioned at the start, we are very fortunate to be sponsored by Curtis Banks, a self-invested pension specialist, for this episode. 
I had the pleasure of speaking to Philippa Heal, a senior marketing executive, to understand why intergenerational fairness is so important to their organisation, specifically through the policy lens of pensions. At Curtis Banks, we understand that protecting the interests of younger and future generations is vitally important when planning for the future. As your 10-year report shows, in just six years, the median individual wealth gap between the oldest and youngest age groups has increased by 43%. So it really highlights the importance and need for wealth to be passed on fairly from one generation to another to try and help bridge that gap. Our question is, why can't changes be made to pension policy to help benefit those younger generations? Policymakers need to think about the future of the younger population and make the transfer of wealth from one generation to another within pensions more accessible without individuals being penalised through things like heavy taxation. Why can't older generations be able to help younger generations through pensions at a time when they're most likely to need it, such as to help with student debt or towards a deposit on a first home? things that a lot of younger people can struggle with and often require significant help towards. So you've mentioned how important it is that we do have intergenerational equality, but what do you think is the solution or a solution to getting there? I think one solution firstly needs to be visibility, transparency, which is exactly what the Intergenerational Foundation is doing and why we are supporting um, the foundation People need to think more, you know, as I mentioned before about policymakers, people need to think about those younger generations, the future generations to come. Our children, you know, what is it going to be like when they grow up? How is that going to impact our children and their children and their children? And how can we make it easier for the wealth pots that, for those older generations to be transferred more easily? We need to be shouting about it louder. We need to be making more noise in order for those younger and future generations to be represented in the right way. For all of those reasons that Curtis Banks are passionate and committed to helping the Intergenerational Foundation continue to raise awareness on the inequalities between generations and help fight for a fairer future. Fighting for equality amongst current and future generations is something that we should all strive towards and is central to the work of IF. If any of the topics and discussion in this month's podcast have caught your attention, then head over to www.if.org.uk, where IF have conducted incredible research into the topic. Or follow the Intergenerational Foundation on Twitter, Facebook, and even Instagram. There, you'll be able to find links to our 10-year anniversary report. See you next month, when we'll be delving into the turbulent topic of climate change in COP26. What if? What if? What if? What if? What if? A monthly podcast series in partnership with IF, the Intergenerational Foundation.